All right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Goldman. I'm a professor of law at Santa Clara University School of Law. And today I'm talking with Matthew Prince, who is the CEO of Cloudflare. And I wanna say thank you to Matthew for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Eric. Okay, um, what we're gonna do is run through some scripted questions with maybe a little bit back and forth. Uh, let me start with the softball. Um, so why don't you just tell me what Cloudflare is and why you founded it? Sure. So. Uh, Cloudflare's mission to start out with is to help build a better internet, which is why when when you approached us for this project, um, it seemed it seemed um, it seemed right up right up the alley of, of things that we think about all the time. Well, we started the company, uh, Michelle Zatlin, Lee Holloway, and I, uh, back in two thousand nine, really realizing that um, first of all, the world was moving from on premise hardware and boxes that you would buy to um, services that were delivered in the cloud. Uh, and all of the things that you had, had turned to in order to make sure that whatever you were doing online was secure, uh, if everything moved to the cloud, there was nowhere to sort of put a box or install install software necessarily to help, help protect you. And so um, what we decided to do was build out a giant network, uh, which would allow our customers, uh, which are everything from you know, individual developers or small businesses up to some of the largest um, uh, internet properties, and companies online to use our network in order to be you know, three things. Um, first and foremost, secure, um, fix some of the underlying bugs of the internet to make it more secure. Um, secondly, uh, reliable, uh, ensure that if somebody drops a, a, an anchor in, in the Mediterranean and cuts a piece of fiber optic cable that your, your website doesn't go offline, it, basically we can route around all of those problems and make sure that you stay reliable and stable all the time. And then, and lastly, fast. We wanted to make sure that um, that you were as, as fast as possible. I think over time, um, there are a couple of other things that we've that we've added to that. Sort of two other pillars. Uh, one is um, private. Uh, it's turned out that as we have thought about our business, um, we really think that privacy is a real key of of both security and and what what people are looking for in in the internet. And then also efficient, um, which which really translates into how do we make sure that the internet is uh, is available to everyone everywhere in the world, whether you're a person who's creating content and wants to reach a global audience, or you're part of that global audience and you're and you're somewhere, uh, you know, in, in sub Saharan Africa or or um, or Latin America or somewhere that you might not have uh, the best internet access, we want to do what we can to make sure that uh, the internet is, is available to everyone. All right, well, super. Um, so when I think about um, the internet ecosystem, uh, sometimes we talk about layers in a telecom stack. Um, let me talk a lot through a little bit. Um, we we think about um, a hierarchy of different activities. There's people sometimes called edge providers or websites or online services are available that are facing the end user. And then there's hosts for those services with, that actually uh, um, uh, provide the servers and the cloud that are necessary for those uh, edge providers to communicate with their users. And then there's um, the internet access providers that uh, connect the servers to the rest of the internet. And then there's the physical layer, the actual uh, hardware that moves all that data that um, uh, is uh, that forms the internet. Um, can you tell me a little bit about where Cloudflare fits in that telecom stack or how you think about it in a different way? Yeah, you know, I, I tend to think about it um, maybe from the perspective of, of where is sort of the ultimate responsibility for the content, um, which is which is flowing. And so I think it maps somewhat to what you what you said, but 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 I'd have it I'd have it somewhat um, uh, a slightly different uh, take on it at some level. You know, I think it all starts with an individual uh, at some level. Whenever there's content which is created online, there's an individual that's that's creating that content. Uh, I guess in some future world it might be an AI or, or something else, but today, you know, it's it's largely the individual. And and in a perfect world, individuals would have that responsibility uh, for that content and and responsibility for the laws and and uh, and norms and everything else that that exists around the world. Under that individual would be sort of the platform uh, that that uh, is is helping promote, organize, distribute uh, the content. So that could be a, it could be a, a Facebook or a Twitter or a WordPress, you know, that is actually providing that infrastructure that is, is, is distributing and organizing and, and making available the content that's online. Below that, um, and this is where it maps to, to what you said, is I, I think of it as being like the hosting provider. In some cases, like a, a Facebook, they, they are both the host and and the the platform itself, but you know, in a lot of other cases, you might have two different organizations that would be responsible for that. 
Below that, I would think of there as being kind of the networks uh, that connect everything uh, together. And then below that would be some of the sort of foundational and fundamental internet protocols and technologies uh, that have to exist to make, make, things, make things work. Um, what's interesting about us is, is I think we would sort of most naturally say that we're sort of that network layer, but I think that we have certain products that are up in that hosting layer, and we have certain products that are sort of down in that more fundamental internet layer. So something like domain registration, um, which, which feels like it's a very, very, very foundational aspect uh, to how, how anything works. And, and ultimately, you know, the registrar of your domain probably it should be at the kind of the very bottom of the stack of people who's responsible um, for, for that content. And so as, as we think about what our role is online, we sort of, we have, we think about it very much on a product by product basis um, because we have certain products where we're actually the host. And I think that in those cases, we have more responsibility uh, for the content that is on those products. We have other products where we're just the domain registrar, we're just the DNS provider. And I think in those cases, um, we're sort of further down the stack and I, and I would be more, uh, reticent to be taking sort of an editorial or any kind of kind of um, content control role uh, on that. Um, but for most of our products, I think we sit sort of squarely in that in that network provider. So I'm not sure exactly how that that that's that's sort of how that's my taxonomy of how I sort of think about the world. And and at and at one level, the way I I, I think about it is it's almost like it's almost like a Jenga blocks stacked on top of each other, where you know you 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 want to sort of do the least harm possible or you want to have the sort of most narrow uh, impact possible as, as you're making uh, content decisions. If at some point you pull out the domain registrar, you pull out the network, then everything above that uh, is, is tricky. We have lots of platforms or hosts that use us as customers. And so we're always very reticent to be making policy decisions on behalf that 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 would affect those hosts before they have a chance, or, the, or those platforms before they have a chance to take action um, themselves. And so, I think in an ideal world, you sort of start at the top and work your way down. Um, uh, but but again, that's, that's that's sort of how we we sort of frame frame the conversation is how we think through some of these policy issues. And I actually, that's a helpful framing for the rest of our discussion. So I'm happy to work with it. When we think about something like Section 230. It makes it very clear the individual is the person who's accountable for their actions and then everyone else below that individual in your hierarchy uh, uh, is absolved of liability for the conduct or uh, content of that individual. Um, and so, uh, but what we're also seeing is a lot of pressure put to push liability and uh, editorial decisions deeper and deeper into the um, taxonomy that you described and I guess one of the unanswered questions of our day is how deep should it go? Um, you know, uh, should it stop with the individual and everyone else is absolved? Or do we say maybe the closer they are, but not the individual themselves, we're going to push uh, a responsibility further to them? You know, I, I, I would love there to be a bright line. Um, I'm not sure that there, there always is a bright line. Um, you, we, I, I think, ide again, ideally, the individuals would take that responsibility, but there are some bad individuals in the world that do illegal things using platforms. And in that case, you know, the platform probably has a responsibility to, to make sure that they are um, doing what they can to, to uh, deal with that, that content. And, and I think, you know, whether that's what the law says now in the United States or not, around the world, I think just, if you think about it from first principles, like it, it, you, you want to have as narrow a impact as possible but you, at the same time, when we all agree that there is some societal harm, and and there are some things that we could we could you know totally agree on are just terrible societal harms that that you probably do want if the individual doesn't take responsibility, you want some layer lower in the stack to take that responsibility. But I think you kind of work down that process in order. You don't want to skip down to the the, the lower layers. If if one of our responsible um, you know platform providers or hosting providers. Uh, if all of a sudden we effectively yank the rug out from under them, then you know their first phone call is, well, how can I how can I trust you in this? And in fact, when we have made decisions in the past to shut down, um, you know, particular uh, customers, one of the very first things that we get are very legitimate, responsible, large um, platforms that use us calling us and saying, well, how can we be sure that you're not going to do the same thing to us someday? And I think that's actually a really reasonable question to ask. And I think for us, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward. There's a there's a big difference between you know a, a, an entire hosting provider which is dedicated to you know illegal content 
and you know someone who and am you know someone who's a who's a totally responsible host or a platform that you know takes no responsibility and actually you know works hard to to undercut uh, sort of the enforcement of law enforcement, legitimate law enforcement actions and other things versus those that, you know, are, are, are again, part of the sort of larger so social contract. And so as we think about it, you know, again, it starts with the individual, but there will be sometimes, um, and actually probably pretty frequently, that bad individuals will need to get policed by the platforms that they use. It will become much rarer that the underlying um, hosts will have to will have to uh, police the platforms, maybe rare, much rarer still that a, a provider like Cloudflare will have to police the hosts. And, and then hopefully we don't get to a point because I think there are some really um, significant consequences where you, you deny fundamental internet technologies for all but you know, the most egregious uh, content. It should, it should almost never get to the point there where you say DNS is cut off for everyone or domain registration is cut off uh, for everyone, Th those seem like um, th that. That seems like the the kind of foundation on which all of the rest of the internet is built, and it it seems very dangerous uh, if we start tinkering with that on a on a policy or editorial basis. Well, it reminds me of the old SOPA battles, which are coming up on their decade um, anniversary, where in fact Congress was you know just a whisper hair away from imposing liability at the uh, domain name registrar level. It would have very uh, foundationally, obviously, changed how the internet works, and uh, and and again, I I think that um, the challenge is that you know if you if you deny someone the ability to register a domain, that is a global uh, impact, and one of the biggest realizations that that has been a real surprise um, in retrospect of starting Cloudflare is how diverse the policies are around the world. You know, when we when we launched the company back in, in 2010, um, the day we launched, we had customers in 10 countries around the world. By the end of the first month, we had customers in literally every, in every country on earth, and we only had eight employees. And so the challenges of figuring out how you think through what the different policy decisions are around the world are, are, are difficult. And the more that you can again, confine that to something which is closer to a local provider, again, in, ideally the individual, but then maybe whatever the platform is that is servicing that local community or the hosting provider that's servicing, you know, maybe a slightly larger community, you know, by the time you start to get to us, you're, you start to have impacts that, that are much broader. And, um, and, and again, I think that's contrary to a, a lot of how uh, you know, the, the internet uh, was, was formed in the beginning. And when you get down to foundational technologies like DNS or, or domain registration, you know, those tend to only be able to be applied on a global basis. And it's, um, it's actually a fairly small list of content that on a global basis, we can all agree um, should just, you know, disappear from the internet. Can we go back to that um, almost romanticized uh, scenario where you've got eight employees servicing a truly global customer base? Um, and you said that you didn't anticipate that going in and uh, what uh, the policy consequences would be from that. Was there something you would do differently because now knowing that you're going to have to navigate this morass of uh, divergent or heterogeneous laws? You know, I... Uh, um... <laughs> I actually think, I mean, there are lots of things I would have done differently in the beginning of Cloudflare, although I think the one of the things where we were better prepared than most was on um, some of the so understanding the, the complications and consequences of these really, really hard um, policy issues. I, I remember, you know, um, about uh, 18 months after, uh, it gets actually a little bit less than that, 14 months after we launched, uh, one day, you know, the FBI showed up at our office uh, with two national security letters, and and um, and and you know, we we, we you do the, 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 the you're not allowed to talk about them, which is which is um, which is uh, arguably a violation of the First Amendment, and and they there there's no check and balance. They're they're entirely administered by the uh, executive branch, which is which is arguably a, a due process violation, and uh, and, and I think that. You know, it was, I, I think that had I not, you know, I often wonder whether the three years I spent in law school were worthwhile, but then I remember moments like that where, um, you know, I, I had the, I think, um, I, either, either courage or, or, or gall or, or hubris um, to, to go to our board and say, you know what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to sue the federal government. 
And, um, and, I, and, I, and, I, and so I actually think that, you know, at, at some level, um, we were really thinking through a lot of these policy. I mean, the, the, the question that we would always ask ourselves when we were eight people above a nail salon in Palo Alto, California, was if Cloudflare ran the entire internet, what would be the right policy decision? And, and I think that that helped us from a very early time make some very difficult um, decisions around, um, uh, around the policy decisions and, and make them optimized for what was the long-term uh, best interest of, of, of really the, the internet as a whole. And, um, and, and so, so, I, so, so there are a ton of things I would have done differently on the technical perspective, on the technical side um, and, and go to market and, and, and all kinds of other things. But I actually, am, I'm really proud of how thoughtful and long-term oriented we've been on the, um, on, on the policy side. And, and, uh, and, 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 and it's, it's part of what I, I still enjoy most about, about, about my job and about working at the company. Can we go back to this uh, issue about bad individuals um, and what should be done about them? Um, and uh, I, can, we can focus on your DDoS service. I think that's the purest way the question arises. When I think about your DDoS service, I think about a service that's designed to protect good actors from bad actors. Um, but what if the person that Cloudflare is protecting is itself a bad actor? And I guess there's a second order question there. How would Cloudflare or anyone else know that they're a bad actor? Um, but can you talk me through a little bit about this, this dilemma that I'm, I'm having with this idea, you know, when it's protecting bad actors from other bad actors uh, versus protecting the good actors from bad actors? Yeah, I mean, there are certain cases where it's pretty easy. Um, so, you know, if, if you know, we're, we're a US based company, uh, that there are, there are certain entities in the United States that are subject uh, to sanctions, um, rules and requirements. And so, you know, if, if somebody tries to sign up and they are a, you know, a terrorist organization or, or, or a, you know, a, a sort of agreed on by the United States government as, as a sanctioned party, then we don't provide our, our services to them. And that's, and that's, that's pretty straightforward. It gets sometimes a little complicated if they sort of hide their identity and or other things. But I think that's one of those places where, you know, we have over time gotten much more sophisticated uh, about, about identifying that and figuring it out. I think the harder time comes when it is um, a, a, an organization that um, is, you know, either um, doing something that, that seems bad, uh, you know, so, so an example in the DDoS space was, excuse me, um, a number of the um, services that you can actually hire to launch DDoS attacks against against other customers, um, they they, uh, they they at times like they, what, the way that they would deal with rivals is they would launch DDoS attacks against each other, and uh, and so you know they would all sign up for cloud the free version of Cloudflare in order to you know make sure that they were protected from each other kind of knocking each other out. And I remember um, there's a there's a um, uh, security journalist, um, a guy named Brian Krebs, who, who I who I actually really really admire and 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 think highly of. But you know, we we have we have gotten in sort of knockdown drag out fights where he's he basically is advocating um, kind of the Mad Max kind of future of the world, which is that the way that you could solve the DDoS problem is that you would basically just drop protection for all the DDoS services, and they would all fight against each other and kill each other. Um, you know, I, I think that there's um, there's some problems. You know, if if you study Nash equilibriums and and things that that actually what you might end up with is much much stronger, more menacing, more evil DDoS services. But that that was one of those early questions, and and I remember it came up uh, for us in um, in in early 2011 when Lulsec, with the um, the hacker group, uh, signed up for us. And again, Cloudflare is a free version of our service, and we don't screen people, um, you know, accepting in sanctions lists and other things uh, before before they sign up. And back in 2011, we weren't we weren't particularly sophisticated uh, about that. Um, but they signed up, and I remember all of a sudden, like you know, you had thousands of people who were screaming at us, saying, you know, how can you possibly have this hacker group that is is using our services? And 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 we often find ourselves kind of on our back foot where. 
we don't know what, what, what we've never even heard of the hacker group. And, and yet people on Twitter or, or email or whatever are yelling at us about, about this or that or the other. And so the challenge, and, and again, I, I, this, isn't, this isn't an excuse, but, it, but one of the challenges I think is that, you know, when you're eight people, um, how you can be an expert on not only every hacker group in the world, but, you know, when, when popvote.hk signs up, uh, and how, how do you how do you know that that's the Hong Kong democracy movement? Um, and, and then in that case, when you get you know an order from the Chinese government say taking it down, what, what do you do? Uh, when you know when when it when a when you know uh, Free Catalonia you know signs up, how, how do you have the expertise on on uh, that that's the Catalonian independence site and and all of the political ramifications that that come behind that when when um uh, you know when an independent journalist in um, uh, in Ukraine signs up, uh, how, how can you know that, that that's, you know, the center of, um, you know, the, the, the conflict in, in Crimea? And, and again, today, I think that we have, even though we're still a relatively small organization, we have a lot more of that sophistication and expertise, but, but you know, every one of those uh, questions that I just sort of outlined as hypotheticals uh, came up for us when we had less than 30 employees. And, um, and so, you know, I, I think that, that it is hard to, and even having lived through it, it's hard to wrap your head around how global uh, technology companies that really take off become almost instantaneously and, and, and asking, uh, leaning on them to say, you know, be not only technology experts, but policy experts, especially what early in their, in their history, um, is, a, is a pretty tall order um, and, a, and a pretty big ask. If you do ask that, then you know that, that that's that's great for us. Um, that means that there will be no you know disruptive Cloudflare new service that comes along, um, because you know if, if and yet we now have the the resources to have the policy people and have the the government relations team and, and ha have those things. And, and ahead of us will be, you know, the Facebooks and Googles and Microsofts of the world. And so, you know, I think one of the things that the, one of the challenges here is how do you start to think about what are the right responsibilities that you put in place for organize for larger organizations? Um, but then how do you still allow kind of a new, a new entrant in the marketplace to, to be able to compete? And that's, um, it's a I, that that is that is uh, that that that's 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 a, that's above my pay grade. So hopefully, hopefully you and and the people watching are thinking about. It. Well, it's certainly a question that I think uh, our project has to grapple with, um, because it's no doubt that's where the tenor of the conversation is. Um, I'm going to come back to this kind of navigating the politics question in a moment, but if you'll indulge me, I do want to talk about the Daily Stormer uh, situation, and my own personal take is that. Um, I thought that the letter that you wrote when you pulled the plug on the Daily Stormer was really, I, I thought, a, a great piece of transparency. Um, you were laying bare for us. You were making a decision. You didn't want to make the decision. You told us why you didn't want to make the decision. Um, and so you really laid out, I think, kind of the whole story um, behind it, where usually in a calm situation like that, is a single positive narrative, um, or you say as little as possible and get the hell out of there. Um, so I thought it was really a helpful um, uh, artifact in internet history to see you lay out your thinking. Um, and if you'll indulge me, I do want to read one uh, piece of it. So you wrote, uh, law enforcement, legislators, and courts have uh, the political legitimacy and predictability to make uh, decisions on what content uh, should be restricted, companies should not. Um, can you talk to me through a little bit about um, how the Daily Stormer is an encapsulation of these dynamics that we've been discussing about, uh, you know, when you're dealing with someone who might have gone from being an unknown actor to maybe a bad actor, and when you say, okay, they're no longer eligible for our services, we're, we're, we need to protect against them, they're no longer the ones we should be protecting. Yeah, so, so starting with um, transparency, when we think of what are sort of the core values uh, of Cloudflare, and, and your core values have to be things that would differentiate you from, from other companies. So obviously we, we wanna be a place that's fair and reasonable and people can do their best work and are rewarded for the work they do. And, and, you know, we're, and, and we encourage a diverse workplace and all those things. But, but what are the things I think are different about Cloudflare? I think we are a relentlessly curious organization 
uh, we're always always taking on new challenges, always always looking at new things. I think we're a very principled organization. We'll talk a little bit more about about some of that. Um, but and I think we're we're also just a radically transparent organization, both internally and and externally. And um, and and it's it's interesting because I think one of the biggest mistakes that technology companies have, and and I think that there's a there's almost DNA that goes back to probably at least Fairchild Semiconductor and 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 maybe maybe even before that of kind of a just relentless secrecy, which is almost pathological uh, at at most companies, and where you know if you if you are privileged enough to get to sit in the policy meetings at a at a Facebook or a Google or an Apple, like it's it's not like they're surprised by how hard these issues are. Um, it's they they have very nuanced. Uh, conversations uh, about about these things. What I think they mistakenly do is that they don't actually share why these decisions are hard. They say, you know, we kicked them off because they violated, you know, paragraph 13G of our terms of service. Well, the terms of service aren't, you know, again, it's not it's not automatically executed. There's still some discretion uh, from the company uh, behind that. And and I think what's been missing in a lot of this is the conversation about how hard um, these issues are. What you know, if if I if I go back to the Daily Stormer, so first of all, the Daily Stormer was a, you know, I mean, the the, the way of describing it at one level, and, and it was that they were a bunch of of neo Nazis. I think that more accurately, they were a bunch of, you know, really internet trolls who were, um, you know, if if if, you know, loving white kittens had been the most offensive thing you could have done on online, they would have loved white kittens. They 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 just literally were looking for whatever the most offensive thing was. In part because they were just attention seeking um, around it, at least it, it seemed seemed to us. That doesn't mean that it wasn't incredibly damaging. It was incredibly distasteful. It was not an organization we were proud to have, uh, you know, uh, use, using our services. But again, if we thought about it of uh, from the perspective of if Cloudflare ran the entire internet, you know, should they be on the internet or not? Like it, it felt like it was that was a a, a pretty a pretty tough call uh, for us for us to be to be making. Um, it. You know, I, I think over the years we had continued to see more and more times where you know some horrible thing would be using us, and we'd get a call from a, a policymaker, or a journalist, who would say, you know, what, how are you thinking about this, and why, why aren't you kicking them off? And ninety-five percent of the time, we'd explain like, hey, here's here's where we sit in the stack. We're different than Facebook or Twitter, and and um, and, and we we think about it this way. And that doesn't mean we don't have responsibility, but but we think that it should sort of play out. Uh, in, in the following in the following way, and 95% of the time, the policymaker, the journalist, would say, "Yeah, that makes total sense." And we would say, if it was a journalist, we'd say, "Well, will you write an article that says, you know, that makes total sense?" And the journalist would say, "You know, company does the right thing is not a story, and so we're not we're not going to write that." And yet, and and policymakers would generally be like, "Yeah, that makes the right the right thing," but there's still this other thing in the corner that I I, that I hate, and I want to figure out how to control it. And, and so what we saw was, especially in Europe, uh, that there was, you know, increasingly kind of painting with a broad brush, a tech companies need to do more to control bad content online. And, and largely when, you know, those, those policies were being written, um, the companies that the, that the policymakers were thinking about were, you know, Facebook and, and Twitter and YouTube. Um, but the way that the policies were written, they were they were sometimes you know starting to creep into a point where we 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 were getting worried that they they might create some really um, uh, undesirable consequences for us, and so all of that was the conversation that we were having kind of on one side, and then and then on the other, um, you know we and 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 internally we we said you know at some point we're going to have to kick someone off, and then talk about why that's that's dangerous, and then. Right around kind of the point that we came to to that conclusion, um, you know, the Daily Stormer people um, just did some of the most repugnant things that you can imagine doing as a as a human being, and uh, and and it, you know, if you're going to fire any customer, firing neo Nazi customers um, is really fun. So um, so we'd fired them, but then, as you said, we wrote very specifically about what the consequences were, and uh, and different than I think a lot of technology companies do. When journalists and policymakers, you know, uh, across the political spectrum called us, um, we didn't say, you know, no comment. Instead, we engaged and we talked about it. And um, and, and I and I spent, you know, the greater part of a, of a year 
meeting with everyone from um, you know, the Southern Poverty Law Center to the Cato Institute to European policymakers and everyone in between and, and sharing a little bit about who we were, but then also you know, talking about what the various the parts of the, the stack were. And, and I think that um, there were still plenty of people that sort of disagreed with what our, our general approach was. Um, but I think people appreciated at least that we were transparent about it, that we engaged, that we listened, and, and that we thought about it. I think over time that those sets of conversations have evolved into you know, the hierarchy of sort of individual platform, host, network, foundational internet technology. Um, and, and, and again, I think we've gone from saying, you know, we, we would prefer to never kick anyone off to saying, listen, we're, we're gonna be a little bit more nuanced about that. If you have a bad individual, a bad platform and a bad host, then sometimes it might actually fall to us uh, to take action, but that should happen fairly rarely. And, you know, for better or worse, as there are laws around the world that compel us to take certain actions, then how can we make sure that as we take an action to satisfy the rules of, you know, China or Russia or India or, or Brazil or, or, or Canada or whoever it is, how do we make sure that the rules of that country don't extend beyond, beyond their, their borders? Um, and, and I think that that's, um, I think that that, that had we not taken that action, uh, it, you know, at risk of, uh, you know, having Immanuel Kant roll over in his grave. I mean, it was, if you're going to use someone for a means to an end, a bunch of neo-Nazis are pretty good, good folks to, to do that with. But uh, I, I think that we learned a lot. Uh, I think that it helped shape what have su subsequently been more um, nuanced and, and technically understanding uh, regulation that's developed um, since then. Um, I, I don't think we're, we're out of the woods. I think we're going to have to keep, keep talking about about these things, um, but but I think that that is um, I, I feel like we have gotten much more sophisticated uh, in in how we think about these policies, in part because we went through that that exercise. Yeah, and you had mentioned earlier that um, when you pull the plug on a customer, it rattles the confidence or trust of other customers. Um, did do you have that experience in this case, or did your other customers say finally, um, you know, but yes, please, more of that? Um, well, so two different stories. Um, so, so one um, story, uh, which is which is probably the less principled um, one, was that one of the things that was the final determination in um, in in us making a decision to kick this particular customer off was that one of our large customers said basically it's them or us, and and uh, and that was not a comfortable. You know, conversation because we are we're a business and and you know we 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 have shareholders and and you know we have responsibilities uh, to them and and at the end of the day you know sacrificing someone who's paying us nothing and is repugnant for someone who's paying us a lot and is you know a, a good organization um, we, we, that 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 was that was a that we didn't love being in that situation but it was it it put us in a in a hard place. What's interesting is. The general counsel of that of that organization um, about six months later uh, called me back and said, "I owe you an apology." And this person, I, I said, well, "What are you talking about?" And this person had just lived through uh, another situation where this was a, a, a software company uh, and they had provided um, services uh, in, in a way that uh, a certain um, uh, group of people found found offensive, and it blew up in in their face. And, and the general counsel said, you know, I, I thought that this was really straightforward, but now having lived through it myself, I see that this is, is incredibly complicated. And I think that, you know, that, that that's, um, I, I, I don't, I don't envy anyone who has to live, live through these, 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 these questions and consequences, but, but I, I do, I do think that they are, that they, that they, that they, as we, as we, as we politicize who customers are, um, that that will have that will mean that uh, as people want to deplatform customers that that uh, or deplatform individuals that they will look at all of the different technologies that they rely on and find ways to say you know can we get the browser to block them can we get their payments processor to block them can we get their you know domain registrar to block them and and there are just so many different routes that if you get any of those things shut off and especially you know if you get that shut off you know industry wide. Uh, that that it really will effectively um, you know kick people off off the internet and and again we can you can think about whether that's a, a good thing or a bad thing um, you know but it 
I, I, it certainly is a is a thing with very significant consequences that we should that we should be thinking through. Um, that was basically the only customer that had given us that that um, conversation. Almost everyone else, um, when when we made it, the the calls from our largest customers were, "Wait a second, you know, walk us through exactly how you did that and explain to us how we can be sure that you, you know, what we think of as this infrastructure company, um, is never are, are never going to do that to to us again." And so, um, and that's you know that's big, reliable, um, trustworthy, you know, financial institutions and, and, uh, and big e-commerce platforms, uh, and others and, um, and not, not internet trolls and, and not anyone who, uh, who you would worry particularly about, but it, uh, it, I think that that's something that much, many more people were worried, you know, well, well please make, how, how can we ensure you won't use that, that power against us as opposed to, uh, how how do we make sure that you use that power more more um, more going forward? And I like the phrase that you use: this politiz politicization. I don't think I can say that word. Uh, uh, politicization of customers, um, because in the end, I think you're in the decisions that your company makes have political consequences, whether you want them or not. They seem unavoidable, and so. How do you navigate that environment when you, I think your preferred option would be don't involve me in the politics. And if that option is available, now what? Well, you know, it's, it's really, it can get really hard in, in other ways. So, um, so for instance, um, you know, we, we watched uh, with, with quite a bit of concern in the 2016 U.S. election uh, as it as it became more and more clear that there were that there was foreign influence um, through disinformation and hacking campaigns, and you know internally, um, you know a bunch of our team said, is is there there must be something that we can do to help with uh, these these sorts of issues? And so we launched uh, in in uh, in early 2017, we launched something we call the Athenian Project, which provides our services at no cost to any um, state. Uh, local or or um, or, or, or uh, uh, county official that is helping administer elections in any way, and you know we can't protect against everything. We don't sit in front of the voting machines, but you know we can help protect the website that you use to register to vote, or um, or the um, or the the, uh, the the place that you go to figure out what your polling place is, or the the API that um, that the that the the dis district. Um, uh, administrators will report back the vote results from, um, and it, you know, and 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 over the course of the four years between 2016 and 2020, um, more than half of of uh, U.S. states and 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 a, and a majority of the um, uh, of the so-called battleground states uh, in the U.S. signed up to use to use our our services, and um, and so you know one of the challenges is um, if if we were seen as as political. In any way, like we were leaning one direction or another, um, you know, whoever won or whoever lost the election could say, "Wow, we don't trust the election results because you know Cloudflare, you know, was was secretly behind the scenes pushing one direction um, or or another." And so, you know, I think there are certain institutions and organizations in the world that we specifically require to be apolitical, um, and the voting process is 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 one of them, and and having you know, met with so many of of the individuals that are that are charged on a on a local basis with administering elections now. You know, it's that is an absolutely thankless, hard but critically important job. And the and the fact that again, we as as a society, at least in in the United States, have, have decided that you know that's a job that should be very apolitical for for what seem like obvious reasons. I think that 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 then suggests that there there should be certain institutions and organizations that that. It's incredibly important that they remain as apolitical as possible, whether or not you know as as um, as norms develop around you know various services, whether that's you know, you know Facebooks or or hosting providers or network providers or or domain registrars, whether the norms develop around that 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 are the same or not, you know I, I think I think time will tell. One of the things that's tricky about all of this is that. You know the, the internet's still in its absolute infancy, and it took us a really long time to figure out what were the norms around 
you know, the, the, the printed word, what were the norms around radio? What were the norms around uh, television? What were the norms around, uh, uh, around you know, the, the telephone system? And then what are the, once you sort of figure out what those norms are, what then are the appropriate laws that, that follow uh, that? Um, I, I think we're still, you know, so, so, so early on that it's, it's not clear um, whether, because, you know, if, if today, if I were talking on, on, on my, my, my phone and I, and I said something, you know, incredibly racist or, or offensive, you know, and, and the phone operator, you know, dialed in and, and pulled the plug, that would be very, very strange. Um, and, and so like, it doesn't seem right that the, that the underlying network operator for the telephone would be making that choice. On the other hand, it seems totally reasonable. And in fact, it's the norm on a global basis um, that at least in the, in the time where newspapers were still, you know, um, thriving businesses, then in almost every major city globally, you would have two different newspapers that would represent the two sort of political extremes uh, that that were there, and you know I I think one of the you know one of the interesting questions is you know what what is what is the natural state of of sort of new new technology that comes along? I was I was talking with um, uh, right before the 2016 election. Uh, I was talking to Julius Janikowski, the former chair of the FCC, and I was over at his house in DC and. And we were having a beer and, and I said, well, I've never seen anything like this in terms of this, you know, political contest and everything that's gone on around it. Do you, do you think that politics is ever going to get back to sort of how I remember it growing up, you know, watching the nightly news with, with Tom Brokaw or Peter Jennings or, or whoever it was. And Julie said something that's really stuck with me um, over the years, which is he's like, why do you think that that's the natural order of things? He said, that's a response to new technology and the new technology trying to keep itself from getting regulated. Where in television emerges in the, in the 40s and 50s, um, you know, it's such this incredibly profitable new technology that comes out and it's limited to, in, in the United States, really just three different um, providers, NBC, ABC, CBS. And like they competed with each other a little bit, but what they were really worried about was how do you stave off regulation. And so, you know, if you're going to create that as a business strategy, you know, what do you do? You, you hire every one of your anchors to have no accent and, and, you know, be from the middle of the country. And it's, it's amazing. If you actually look at the data, how many news anchors actually grew up in Kansas, um, you, you make sure that you cover every political convention from opening speech to balloon drop at the end, which like three different networks covering the exact same thing is like the worst idea. And yet to this day, the major networks still cover, you know, the political conventions um, from, from beginning to end with basically the same, the same content and the same, the same feeds, you know, you don't, you don't oppose equal time laws um, as they, as they get, as they get proposed. Um, because again, you're, what you're really trying to do is stave off regulation. Um, that I, I think that if you then start to think about, what are the platforms of the day that have incredible value and that have are trying like crazy to stay neutral, whether that's Google with search. And it's, I mean, it blows my mind that there isn't a Fox News search engine. Like overnight, if Fox launched a search engine, it would have what, 20% market share, which is a, on its own a you know, $40 billion company uh, in, you know, in the United States. And, and, and yet, you know, Google has done a great job, at least with search of staying right down the center. And, you, and yet you can start to see them getting pulled in either direction. The arguments that search and the search results are inherently political. Um, you know, the, the Facebook is in the exact same place. And if you think of Facebook as the modern newspaper, you know, it really is quite remarkable that there isn't a, a conservative Facebook and a liberal uh, Facebook the same way that that's, that's happening around the rest of the world. So I think that it is a, I'm not sure it's the natural state that you can stay neutral. I do think that there are certain institutions uh, like like the like the voting apparatus that we as a society have decided are so important that they have to be that way. I think there are some other technologies like the telephone system that have uh, that the norms have evolved to be that way. But if you look at you know what the natural state now of television, where it's where it's obviously fractured into a million different channels, or or the natural state of of newspapers, which um, you know have, have obviously fractured into into different different sides. I'm not. I, it'll be interesting to see how. The, the sort of more editorial uh, functions, whether that's search ranking or, or, um, or social media, how those, how those uh, whether, whether they're able to stay neutral over, over the long term. 
So let me la ask my last question uh, to you, um, which uh, I had already previewed and which you've already touched on, but knowing what you know now, uh, 12 years after the founding of uh, Cloudflare, um, what would you do differently if you were to go back in time? Um, is there something that you've learned along the way that says, boy, I really need to plan for a different scenario than what I uh, thought I was? You know, I think that, um... So, so it depends on 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 what what level. Um, I think that one of the things that that um, has become a priority for us now, which I wish um, had been a, a bigger priority early, is is how do we figure out how um, to you know just not only reduce but 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 make our 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 impact on the environment um, you know uh, much you know it literally negative. The internet burns you know a huge amount of of resources and energy resources, um, a lot of which is just wasted. And I think it's it's something that um, you know we have we have only more recently um, realized how important that that is. And and I think that we're we're taking we're doing a lot of things to you know make kind of our, our carbon uh, footprint um, uh, negative. That was that was the first thing that that sprung to mind because it's it's something that really in the last eighteen months um, ha has become internally a, a priority and and it's something that could have been a, a bigger priority um, earlier in the company's history. I think from the the policy perspective, um, you know, I think that I think we did a good job of engaging uh, in in policy conversations early, and I think we punched way above our weight. Um, but I I, I, I wish I, you know you always can do more, and and I wish that we'd done more. I think the place that we have not paid enough attention to that um, that my hunch is. Uh, is probably the most important region in the world for the future of, of internet policy and regulation is India. Um, I think there used to be sort of two poles in sort of internet regulation. There was sort of the Chinese way, um, and and the you know for a long time the Chinese way it didn't totally make sense to me. And then somebody described it um, in a way that 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 really clicked, which is they said you know if you were launching a, a radio station or a TV station. Um, you have to go to the FCC in order to get clearance for the spectrum. Uh, and there would be some what felt like somewhat arbitrary rules. You know, there are seven words you can't say on, on the air. And, and if you break those rules, they'll, they'll withdraw your, your spectrum license. Uh, they said, you know, that's just the exact, that's the model for how China thinks about the internet, which is, you know, you have to apply for a license, which is called an ICP license, in order, in order to publish content inside of China. There are some rules that you have to follow. If you don't follow the rules, they withdraw your license and you, and you disappear from the internet. And, and I think that that's actually, you know, there, there are some reasons that doesn't, um, you know, doesn't make sense to everyone. But I think that if you just think about that as, oh, it's they think of the internet the same way that the U.S. thinks about radio or TV, um, it, 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 it just seems a little bit less foreign. But, you know, that was one policy direction. The other was the U.S. policy direction, which, you know, it's hard to overstate how radically libertarian the US view of freedom of expression is. And you know, I, I grew up as part of it. My dad was a journalist for a part of his career. And, and you know, we talked about the First Amendment and all that around, around the dinner table. So, so it, it seems like it works pretty well to me, but, but, but it is a radical, radical, radical experiment. And it is not the majority opinion around the world. And so what's, what has been amazing about the internet is it basically took the US approach to freedom of expression and exported it um, globally, which obviously is is been um, very disruptive to a lot of a lot of businesses and, and a lot of institutions uh, uh, around the world. Um, I think that unfortunately, um, the the world is is um, is not uh, going to continue to accept kind of the U.S. view of internet regulation uh, going forward, and even the U.S. might not have the, accept the the U.S. view of internet regulation. I don't think that people, most countries around the world are quite ready to go to the full uh, Chinese version and, and it, the, the, the horse is sort of out of the barn in, in most places. So it's hard to, hard to put it back in. Um, but I think the world is looking for what that new model is. And, um, and I think Europe um, you know, is, is, has got a bunch of things, but it sort of doesn't have, doesn't have the sort of cohesion to sort of figure it out. Um, Brazil has the sort of gravitational mass, but um, has, has a number of other things that they are that they're focused on. I think India is the other country that is, is going to really maybe set what the new standard is um, for internet regulation. And I think that that's, 
that's something that you know on one hand um you know it's it's amazing that it's a it's it's a it's a it's a very high functioning democracy and has has very strong freedom of expression rights on the other hand it's been um you know ha had a lot of of concerning uh rules and regulations over the year around encryption and and uh and, and, and other things and so so I think that's a place where um, I think we have underinvested as a as a as an organization uh, and maybe as a as a um, as a group of people who are thinking about internet policy. And I think watching what happens in India and where and where India goes um, is, is something that we're we're spending more time thinking about. And, and I and I would encourage as as people want if people who are interested in sort of the future of internet regulation to to spend time watching watching what happens there. And if you indulge me on that last point, though. Is there something that Cloudflare or a broader set of internet services could have done that would have staved off the potential crisis that we might experience in India, where I'm very troubled about um, the rules that the government's adopting? Um, but it, was that avoidable or is it, was that always inevitable? We just got here now. Yeah, you know, you, you wonder what, so, so, you know, I guess maybe a different way of asking the question would be, is there any way that the world could have just continued on the path of sort of following the 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 U.S. model of of internet regulation, which is which is largely an you know anything goes um, model, and, and and I think that that's um, you know I'm not sure that that's a stable uh, place um, for 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 this. I think that the internet's such a incredibly disruptive force um, for traditional organizations that you know. That that yeah you know episode four of Star Wars was seemed pretty optimistic but episode five is the Empire Strikes Back and and I think we are we have lived through episode four and we're going into episode five and 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 you know governments and regulators around the world are are definitely going to strike back um, and I and I think that um, again I think that that is to some extent um, a result of of uh, you know a number of sort of just excesses. Uh, that that um, that that have happened online. Um, it is it is also a result of you know imposing what was again a radically libertarian view of freedom of expression on on a world that that um, doesn't necessarily accept it. Like you you know I, I often um, get sort of pillared as as being you know the the, the term when people want to criticize me they're like Matthew is a free speech absolutist and I'm like I'm not a free speech absolutist at all. I, I think I'm probably a due process absolutist, but uh, but but I, I do think that it's hard, you know, if you go to to um, German, you know, policymakers and you and they say, you know, we'd, we'd like you to control neo-Nazi content in, in Germany and you say, well, what about the First Amendment? You know, they're polite if they don't roll their eyes. Um, but 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 they say, listen, if they're polite, they'll say, listen, we understand that that is part of your uh tradition and part of your history, but please understand that we have a very different tradition because we had a very different history. And like, I think you have to respect that um, at, 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 some, at some level. And, and so, you know, what I, what I hope is, what I hope is that, you know, we, we were sort of over here, what I hope is we certainly don't swing all the way to sort of the, um, you know, Chinese FCC, everything has to have a license um, view of, of internet regulation globally. Um, I, again, I think that would be difficult to put the horse back in the barn. Um, but I think that there, there might be a lot of things that, um, that, that start to control that. And the question, you know, of how, how you might've avoided that, I, I don't know. Um, but I think it's, it's a question that's worth, it's worth asking and, um, and it's one that, um, and again, I think it's what what I'm encouraged by uh, is um, that you know when we kicked a bunch of neo Nazis off in a in a somewhat arbitrary way, you know, a number of of newspapers, uh, prominent newspapers in Germany wrote, you know, neo Nazis are bad, but I'm not sure that you know Matthew Prince or this low level network thing we've we've never heard of should be the one making making that determination. And so I think that if governments do you know, have very transparent uh, uh, processes. And, and, and if they do follow, you know, what, what in the US we call due process, what around the rest of the world you'd call rule of law. Um, I, I actually think that that um, I, I'm, I'm optimistic that while we might go through sort of a transition time, 
that um, as long as there's transparency, um, accountability, and consistency, which are sort of the foundational pillars of, of any, any system of rule of law, um, that, that we probably come out of this in a way which is um, where, where the internet looks more like it did over the last 30 years than, than uh, where, where the sort of worst case scenarios um, have, have looked at in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the last little bit. Because while there again have been some, some, some real challenges the internet has created, you know, I, I think none of, us, it, it, none of us can underestimate the amount of good uh, that it's done, and, and it's and it's actually important for us to all continue to um, you know remind people that that um, that like I mean, can you imagine how much worse this pandemic would have been if if it had happened just ten years earlier? It's uh, we're we're able we were able it was obviously still a horrible event for humanity, but but a lot of people were able to continue to connect with their loved ones, get work done, um, you know, uh, go about their daily lives um, in part because the internet continued to work and. Um, and and I think I'm hopeful that uh, that 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 maybe that's that's one of the things that we'll remember and and uh, will help us fight to preserve um, you know what what it is we've created. Well, um, I always love ending on a note of optimism, and you gave more than I would have expected. So, um, if there's anything else you want to add now, um, that's great. Otherwise, uh, I think uh, we'll um, we'll say thank you. I well, the one thing I would ask is that whenever you write about the internet, no matter what the AP says capitalize it because if i have to point <laughs> to a period a point in time when it all started to go wrong it was when the ap said i think in 2016 that you could now lowercase the internet and you know i think what's amazing about the internet is that it is a network of networks and there is only one and uh and so i think it being a proper noun is important and so i i have a, my, my little tiny crusade on the side is capitalize if you care about the internet capitalize it I feel like you can truly tell the internet's old guard by those who still capitalize the internet. I'm one of them. Sounds like you are too, but we are a dying breed. I don't. So I think, wait, we, Eric, we, you and I have to lead that that campaign on on you know if you if you care about the internet, capitalize it. So. <laughs>